can you believe that they let Jackson Mahomes take place of Patrick in the fourth quarter? What's that? Sorry, somebody just interrupted. That was Patrick? Oh. That's surprising, considering he was acting like a little bitch. <laughs> what is up, ladies and gentlemen? This is Adam Pecora, and you have tuned in to Requiem for a Tuesday. Thanks for listening. Um, we will get into the Bills Chiefs as well as the entire NFL in just a little bit. But first, please rate, review, and subscribe to Requiem for a Tuesday wherever you get your podcasts. We're there. Uh, numbers have been great this year. Hoping to ramp that up even more as we go into 2024. You like that? Uh, yeah. We got merch, rfat.bigcartel.com. You can follow me on Instagram at adam.rfat. Uh, links in the description below for everything. Uh, there's music, multiplex, me and Justice, as well as Justice's show. And he's got music, and we got a whole bunch of stuff. And everybody can go enjoy almost all of it for free. Probably all of it. I just didn't want to lie. Oh, boy. Uh... Well, I guess I'll get the elephant in the room out of the way. If you notice a bunch of just weird pauses and restarts, like if you can very much tell, I am way sicker than I was the last time I said I was sick, which may have been last episode. I don't really know. Uh, I woke up on fr no, Friday night. Yeah, it started Friday night, but Saturday morning was unbelievable. But Friday night, all of a sudden, your boy just starts coughing up phlegm. I didn't, ha I didn't know I had that much phlegm. I thought my sickness had left. Apparently, gravity moved it to my chest. Uh, and then that turned into a whole virusy thing. I thought I had a fever. I don't really know. I don't own a thermometer. Go figure. Uh, luckily, not the COVID. That's, I was able to check that. Uh, I'm sure I sound terrible. There's, n I, you know... I feel better for the most part. That's why I'm still doing this. Uh, but yeah, just a heads up. I apologize for that in advance. Uh, I've just been hacking it up. Uh, we'll see how it goes. I'm also high as shit, as you're aware of the title. So I don't really know what's... I'm in a weird spot being like sick and high and uh, I had an Americano, so I'm a little, I'm a little energized. I got a, I got a whole bunch of weirdness going on. A uh, bit of a fever dream. But yeah, I was bedridden Saturday, Sunday, completely, pretty much. Um, but here I am, once again, you know, stepping it up for my ones of fans. <laughs> I was going to say tens, but even that, I don't like to brag, you know? <laughs> uh, but yeah, thank you guys for listening. Please share, review, rate, do all the things that you do for the famous ones that don't need your help. <laughs> um, I'm just messing with you. But yeah, do all that stuff. It helps a lot. And uh, get the word out. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, so on Friday, before it all really went down for me, I was able to get a viewing in of the boy and the heron. Uh, the whole stu the whole new Studio Ghibli movie. I don't care if that's not how you pronounce it, okay? So don't come at me for that. Uh, listen, also, this is if this if the weebs somehow find this, I don't want the wrath, okay? I'm an outsider in this situation. I'll admit it, but, you know, I just want to clarify that, that this is strictly from a critical perspective or whatever. I don't know. Point is, I saw the movie. Uh, famously, did not have any promotion, no trailer, no really anything. Uh, even in Japan, 
This is Miyazaki's newest film after he retired 10 years ago. They were working on this for like four years or whatever, maybe more. Um... And I saw the dub, not going to lie, okay? I'm I'm way too lazy. I'm not an animated film. I can't be reading especially, like either way. You know, let me look around. Let me see what's going on. I want to enjoy this. So, it was breathtaking, animation-wise. Um, but that's kind of a given, Right? Like, if you've seen any Studio Ghibli movie or you're just familiar with them, you know, at least, you know, you've seen some some stills, maybe. Maybe you've seen some clips, whatever. At some point, you've probably seen something from one of these somewhere. You know, Totoro's everywhere. Ponyo was huge when it came out. Uh, Spirited Away is everywhere. So, you you know, you get the gist. This one was as beautiful as any of them. I have... You know, I've seen maybe, I've seen like all the major ones, I think, except Ponyo and uh, the last one before this, The Wind Rises. I didn't see that one. But, you know, all the major ones, Kiki, whatever, all, all, all those ones, Spirited Away, you know, seen all those. And they're great. I love them. Very imaginative, always phenomenal. I was going to say animation, animation, all of that. Um Incredible writing, you know, a lot of depth in these movies. They're not wacky goofball movies for kids. They are for kids, but there's like deep meaning that kids could really potentially take something away from. And either way, it's just great cinematically. So it's definitely adult friendly every time, which was always like a huge Pixar praise in their heyday. Uh, Ghibli way ahead of the curve on that, I would say. But also Japan. I mean, what don't they have that's better? I hate to admit it, you know? They really figured out a lot of stuff over there. It bothers me, you know? But I get it. Everybody, you know, you got to have your wins. We can't have them all. But uh, if that isn't the American mentality, boy, am I, God, I love this country. I'm like, why didn't we win everything? <laughs> You know, Apple, Google, Ford, Tesla, like, you know, to name four out of a hundred thousand. But still, the toilet thing, especially after this sickness, boy, it's like a crackhead's lips in my asshole. It's unbelievable. What am I, And there's nothing I can do about it. There's nothing I can do about it. Just wince and grit it out. Anyway. <laughs> So, my thing with this movie, The Boy and the Heron, I will say also, the voice cast, the U.S. voice cast, unbelievable. Like, star-studded as could be, but they're also all excellent. Like, the performances are great. They they arise to the occasion of the quality of the movie. I, I don't know how rights for any of this stuff works, so I don't know if, like, somebody acquires... Do do you get distribution and then you get the right to dub or not dub it? Do you get just dub rights? Is that its own thing? Um, I don't know. I'm sure Studio Ghibli especially gets to be a lot more demanding in how the dubs work. Like requirements. But either way, they did a great job. So whoever was in charge of overseeing all of that, they did phenomenally. Um but I'm sure that's why a lot of dubs get fucked up, right? Because like certain companies just don't have the leverage, and then you know, L.A. being L.A., they're like, ah, fuck it, you know, send it over here. We'll do it for five grand or whatever, you know. And then you get shitty voice actors and shitty translation, and whatever. Um, bad outsourcing, I guess. But they were all great. Robert Pattinson also, when I found out that he was the Heron, when you hear the Heron's voice, you would never imagine that that's that man. Uh, he, he just continues his tear of uh, incredible performances. He has really, really stepped it up. Love you, Patty. Uh, but I do got to say, so here's the thing. This movie is the same as like four other Studio Ghibli movies. The fact that it's like being like, ah, oh, this this one's his masterpiece. Finally. He's finally did it. 
his masterpiece. He's cracked the code. It's like, it's the same movie. It's the same fucking movie. Here's the plot of this movie, okay? A lonely, isolated kid for X reasons. I'm going to say it broadly and then I'll get into the actual details, but just for the sake of the argument. This kid is isolated and lonely and is in a new place, okay? And then he stumbles into a magical world. <laughs> like, it's the, sa- it's the same thing. And then he has to learn something about himself along the way. <laughs> and it's like, and once he learns that lesson, he will resolve the issue. It's like, yeah, we get it, man. It's all just a metaphor for growth and acceptance and all this shit. You know, and maybe it's about a different specific thing. Look, they're saying this movie's more personal for whatever about elements, but like this is all the same shit. It's the same. <laughs> and I don't really see that as a critique. Maybe that's me being cynical. Maybe that's the thing. It's like the synthesis of the work. You know, you can you can say that like Michael Mann's movies are all the same, but like they're really not. Like they're just not. You know, they might have the same themes, sure, but this is like the same plot, like on screen. It's the same. It's the same exact thing. Um, So this kid's mom dies tragically during World War Two. There's like a hospital fire. Now they do this really quickly as an intro. It's like a couple minutes. Um, You know, he tries to run down to the hospital. Obviously, he's a kid. He's not going to be able to do it. Now, he kind of holds guilt in his heart that, you know, he could have done something different. They allude to a lot of this, which is unbelievable. Like they're very cinematic and like they're able to accomplish what like a strong shot and a facial reaction would be in a movie to like know what someone's feeling without them expressing it. The fact that they can convey that through animation is unbelievable. Uh, There's a lot of great imagery where he like wakes up in flames. It's like something out of a Scorsese thing or something. Um, Just amazing stuff visually and like they do almost like full watercolor landscapes that these people are animated through when they walk and stuff phenomenal like it has to be the best drawn one yet now there's not this like animation innovation like spider-man but in it's like as good of quality animation as you will ever see honestly Especially hand, the fact that it's hand done is even more unbelievable. I, I see why it would take so long. <laughs> uh, so then the dad, the boy's dad, just start, just starts fucking uh, his wife's sister because he's a busy man and it's World War II and he's got planes to build because he's a rich man and he's busy. And uh, that's just casually a thing. I don't know if that's how... I mean, that does sound very Japanese. I'm not going to lie. Just very efficient, business-like. You're in the... You know, step up. Uh, But wild. They they just kind of breeze by that. I I had to clarify that later. I was like, why is it just implied that I'm supposed to know who this lady is? Uh So, yeah, that's just fine. And he just knocks her up like a year later. Like, (laughs) it's insane. She's like many months pregnant, like one year later. So, anyway, they have to move out of Tokyo to like a smaller town, basically so the dad can oversee a factory making planes for World War II. So, also, technically, I'm just saying, as an American, we're just like watching the enemy. (laughs) <laughs> you know what I mean? This is technically like the protagonist is technically like a Nazi ally, which I'm just realizing, um, like technically, you know what I'm saying? And I get it. It's, a, you know, it's a Japanese film and it's a true, you know, it happened. They were there doing that stuff. Just in, just interesting. I just put that together. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so the Nazi boy <laughs> uh, is in his new town, feels isolated, blah, 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 blah. Uh, his dad's at work all the time. So all, all that's around him is his new stepmom, which is his aunt, <laughs> technically. And 
Wow, that's so fucking weird. What the fuck? Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, he doesn't. He's rude to her, basically, and he's shut down, and she's being real nice to him, of course. And uh, then he goes to the new school, and everybody can, like, tell he's rich or, like, from Tokyo or something. There's, like, a class difference thing. So they all, like, kick the shit out of him. And then, you know, the dad's like, I'm an army man, big shot. I'm going to go yell at them or whatever. And then the kid just beats the shit out of himself with a rock just for no reason, basically to, like, not have to go back to school. And it's kind of like, that's just a big puss move, but okay. So then he goes back to his, like, house, his new house, which I think is just his aunt's house or his mo- his aunt mom's house. <laughs> um. And they live with like 10 old women who are maids and they all just love cigarettes and there's this tobacco shortage, which, you know, that makes sense. I'm sure all the tobacco used to come from here and probably still does. We got that witch Virginia soul. You ever, <laughs> you ever bathe in the rich Virginia soul? Okay. <laughs> I am fucking high, you guys. Okay. So anyway, there's one lady, there, there's like some random giant castle who like their great uncle built because some meteor fell from the sky and it's like a giant magic rock and then they build, he built a big castle around it to like protect it. This movie sounds terrible when I'm sounding it out, but it's good. It, it really is good. Uh, and then they're like, ah, don't go in there. It's dangerous in there. Somebody went in there, got lost. And like his mom went in there and she was gone for a year. Nobody knows what happened. It's like mysterious. Ah, whatever. Sounds like spirited away. Uh, it's the same fucking thing. Anyway, and then he goes in there and it's like a magic door. And there's like universes or whatever. He goes into some universe and just gets help from somebody. Also, this heron is stalking him, and it's very clearly a man in a suit. I don't know. The heron character is very like, uh, it's like an old, sc- it's like the wizard, he's like the Wizard of Oz, I guess. Uh, and very ugly. And then, yeah, it doesn't really make sense. I, I, I was kind of confused. The heron just harasses him and then leads him to this thing, but, like, for no reason. But I'm pretty sure it's because the guy at the end put him up to it to, like, lead him there on purpose. But I I don't know if that's implied or not, but we'll get there. So then the heron takes him to the thing. They go through, like, different worlds and meet, like, alternate versions of people that are in his life. Like, I think he meets his mom when she's younger or something, or his aunt when she's younger. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. His new mom, aunt, uh, and like the one of the maids when she's younger and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, the boy and the heron like struggle and they're trying to like deceive. They fight the whole time and then eventually they come together and whatever. They just get away with it. all, All of a sudden, basically what happens is all of a sudden the kid just caves and starts calling his aunt, mom, mom. When she's like, I hate you after he tries to save her because she's trapped in the world. That's why they went there, right? Sorry, I forgot that. For some reason, the mom just waltzed in there. And I think it's implied that she did it to get away from them. I don't know. She waltzed into the castle, and so he had to go in after her to save her. And then he calls her mom, and she's like, okay, now I don't hate you. Uh, I'm sure something had to have gotten lost in translation along the way there because it just kind of doesn't really add up. Frankly, like, it doesn't really seem like the boy learns that much about anything. And then he's eventually just like, oh, I'm just going to call this lady mom, even though it's just my dead mom's sister. And I should really have problems with my father about this, (laughs) which is maybe implied. I don't know where he's like, hey, it's not her fault. She needed money. I I don't know. Fucking bizarre. Uh (laughs) Uh, and then he comes back and everybody's happy. <laughs> and that's pretty much it. Um, I guess that doesn't sound that great. 
But it was beautiful. That's really the main thing. But yeah, my my major complaint, like the plot is just like the same as kind of everything else. And uh, it's like a Nazi boy and a weird inter-family fuck fast. <laughs> so yeah, check it out. Good ship. <laughs> Okay, so the moment we've all been waiting for, the three-quarter season recap is here. Uh, And I'm so much more high than when I started the episode. Like, it's still going up. So this is going to be wild still. Uh, Don't you worry. I did not waste a second with that intro. You're getting every bit of the goods. Uh, These NFL and Edibles episodes have been huge, so this one better be three times as big. For how fucked up I am. You, I, do not take edibles when you have a viral chest infection, apparently. Okay. Oh, where do I start? <laughs> that was unbelievable. I was so geared up, and then I just lost it. Uh, so the perk of being sick on a Sunday is, boy, was I chilling. I had my little blankie, my cup of tea, my glass of OJ, my feet up, and I was zombied out for seven hours of commercial free football um why do red zone on the small tv while when the bears are playing and then i swap them later well really i just turned the small one off what do you need a broadcast game on for anyway so i'm gonna open with either way i need to do a chicago bears update um, if you haven't heard my many Chicago Bears episodes this season, I you know, I don't know if they've aged incredibly well or very poorly. So probably incredibly well, because let's be honest, I'm the foremost expert on the Chicago Bears in the comedy circuit. <laughs> uh no, look, once again, it's like they're setting us up for our hearts to be broken. And ultimately, it's like the coaching is still fucked because this team is five and eight. They absolutely should be seven and six with the Denver game and the first Detroit game being absolute meltdowns to end up as losses. Like Detroit was three minutes left to possession to touchdown technically lead. Um and Denver was also 14. Was that 17? I don't even remember. That was brutal. And if if we even just want to be generous and say that, okay, they deserve to lose one just because things tend to average out, you know, then they're six and seven. You could argue the Saints game should have been a win. I mean, Bajan, horrific fourth quarter, another huge collapse. But anyway... They're five and fucking eight. And if they win out, that's incredibly intriguing. And they're playing well, quote unquote. But the thing is, everybody's like, well, now they won two division games in a row. But it's all hindsight because, of course, yes, they looked great against the Lions. I'll get to that. But the word here and everyone felt, and I agree, after the Vikings game was that sucked. Yeah, they won, but who gives a fuck? Like, that was cringe and embarrassing. So now all of a sudden that's a quality win? Like, I don't think so. Because the Vikings are terrible. They're done. They're going to lose. Like, their momentum has completely died now that Dobbs has failed. And Jefferson just got hurt again. Like, I think that they're probably just going to lose most of their games remaining out. But I don't know their schedule. Anyway. And it's like Cleveland. Let's think back to Justin Fields' first start. Horrific. Like one of the worst things I've ever watched as a Bears fan. I wanted to kill Matt Nagy after that game. I believe I did an episode right after that where I just screamed the entire time. That was an absolute travesty. And you hope the team has improved enough beyond that. But I'm just worried. Like Fields still just holds the ball and they have a great secondary. I think he's going to take some big hits. I don't think it's going to be as egregious, and he's not going to get sacked nine times, hopefully, but he'll probably, Garrett will get a fumble on him, I imagine. Even though our offensive line is actually, like, legitimately pretty solid at this point, 
nobody's Miles Garrett solid. I mean, outside of like four or five tackles in the entire NFL, maybe. And even then, that I feel like that was offensive to Miles Garrett, and I apologize, Miles. Um, I have a ton of respect for him. I, I you know, there's an argument that he's the best player in the NFL, in my opinion. Anyway. They also easily could win because you can see the way the defense is playing now, which again is how they should have been playing. The the start to the season is still unacceptable. The fact that they were 0 and 4 but also in such an embarrassing and dead fashion where they were absolutely for those four games the worst team in the NFL. It was unwatchable and you know, sure, the season is a progression, but you don't get to come out looking like you're not training camp ready. You know, you have a whole off season to prepare for a fucking reason. So you don't get four weeks to get right. You're not the Patriots 12 years ago. And even then, they would never be 0-4. You know, they'd be like a rough 3-1 and or 2-2 two and two at worst. So... You know, fuck anything the coaches say. They're fucking buy me more time comments. That you know, it, it's horrific to hear. <laughs> I, you know, it's like I wish we had just paid Eberflus a ton to be like the highest paid defensive coordinator in the league, and then hired B enemy or. Uh, that probably would have been like the only guy who was available last year that I can recall that would have been like definitely needing. I don't know. Anyway, that would have been the ideal scenario because he is clearly a great defensive coordinator and the offense is improving, but Getsy's just horrific and he doesn't seem to be doing anything to affect Getsy. And there's still just, there was too much negative. I mean, unless they literally can pull it off and win it, win out. There has been just too much negative to outweigh what has been positive. But the defense now does look like what I thought it was going to look like. Like they're a top 10 unit. The pass rush still isn't great. Um, It's not consistent enough. Now they happen to get it done when it mattered the most, which is all you can really ask for anyway against the Lions this week. But... It's not reliable. They're not getting pressure at any remarkable rate. And they're still probably last in sacks despite the total going up a bit, finally. Um, Too many dropped interceptions still, but the fact that they are all over the ball is incredibly encouraging either way. You wish you get a pick every time, obviously, and it's a bit disappointing. But realistically, they were just a fucking saloon door prior, you know what I mean? The first half of the season. So what's the term I was looking for? Turnstile, whatever. A saloon door. Jesus Christ. Uh, It's remarkable. And Edmonds is finally playing like, okay, but man, it's like, you should have just paid Roquan a few more million and then not signed him. And with TJ Edwards, I think that would be nuts, but whatever. It's fine. And Montez Sweat, thank you. I love you. You're fantastic. Super glad you signed that extension, bro. Or that would have been rough. Um, And yeah, like I said a few episodes back, like I'm back in on Ryan Poles is basically my point overall here. Like this roster is filled with really good players. Now, you know, there's he has made bad moves. The Claypool trade, obviously is glaring and it seemed like a high draft pick even at the time and it just looks worse and worse and worse and worse and but that's fine I mean you get to make a few bad moves you know Valus Jones was also a terrible draft pick that that kid unfortunately I don't know why we don't use him just as a running back like he's very fast why why isn't he just like taking handoffs you know Debo like play him like Debo not that he's fucking Debo, that's for sure. But you know what I mean? Like, wh- why are we not just setting up little plays for him to just get the ball? Um, those, like, sweep pop passes forward, something like that. Uh, Getsy loves his fucking screens, you'd think. But whatever. He must be terrible in practice. 
That really must be what it is. The fact that they don't even attempt stuff like that. Or also, they're just not fucking creative at all on offense. So why would they try something like that? Is also another argument. You never fucking know with this team. Um, Look, Darnell Mooney, I don't know what happened, but I don't even care. I'm sorry. Uh, DJ Moore is so fucking good. The, the Panthers are so stupid. <laughs> they wanted to keep Brian Burns so bad that they're like, we're going to trade up for a quarterback by getting rid of what would be his best weapon. I thought that was crazy at the time. And your defense is not good. And But the fact that we have DJ Moore instead of Brian Burns is incredible because now we have Montez Sweat. It really just amazing and any argument about the Montez Sweat trade not being worth it is stupid because we have that player for four years which would have happened with a second round pick and yes it is for more money but if we drafted a defensive end exactly the same with that draft pick there's he probably would not be as good as Montez Sweat for those four years so there's not really an argument there and uh especially the tweet I said this already I don't care I'm high the argument was like a team that's rebuilding doesn't it's like they are rebuilding which means that they need talent like the argument is just stupid and it's just dogging it and i think the bears are fucking dog shit and stupid most of the time so i get really offended when these outsiders try to act like every move is dog shit and stupid because obviously this one made a ton of sense he's actually a proven guy who's been consistently good it is nothing like the chase claypool trade which is haunting. I get it. I get it. But it doesn't matter. Like, one second round pick is not going to make or break an entire fucking franchise. Like, how great is Joey Porter Jr.? I haven't heard his name all year. So I don't, like, no offense to him. I'm, or even if he is doing very well, I just have no idea. The Steelers are another fucking shit show. Either way. So it's like, we're all good. <laughs> But look, I mean, considering the circumstances with how clearly just unskilled the coaching staff is, or at least just unprepared for the moment, like Getsy, definitely not. He's just not good. He's not a good play caller, not a good schemer for the most part. There are flashes of it, but he's incredibly inconsistent with it, and most of it is shit. It's naggy esque but a little bit better. Um, but I think that's also credit to Justin Fields, who, I mean, still holds the ball too long and too much, but the fact that he's gotten better at it, and look, he's not turning it over, I'm back in, like I really am, and the line is better, and DJ Moore is there, and Komet is legit, and it's like, we're going to have this first pick again. And look, even if both of those quarterbacks end up with good careers, which is pretty much unlikely, even the C.J. Stroud example is incredibly rare. Like, dudes don't just come in and light it up. So it would put the Bears back like two more years. Either way, like a rookie's not going to win the Super Bowl. Not that they're going to win it next year, but I think that they would actually realistically be expected to make the playoffs next year especially with a new coach ideally um and you're going to have the first pick again and with the frenzy that there will be for these quarterbacks you can potentially get three first rounders maybe two second rounders maybe another good player you know, maybe this time you do get another edge rusher and then you don't have to draft one or sign one in free agency. You know, maybe you have to extend them just like with Sweat. Then we have two. You draft Marvin Harrison. You know, you move back to three, whatever. Huge weapons on off. If you can get an offensive lineman with your own first round pick, I would say. 
No offense to Braxton Jones, though. He is good. We really need a center somewhere along the way. I think that's the key move. No offense to Lucas Patrick. Like, I love his attitude and everything like that. Um, I mean, he is just an older guy. Like, we need a young center. I'd be fine if Patrick started again next year, honestly. The offensive line is not an issue anymore, which means our offensive line coach should probably stay, whoever that is. I think that that really is the move. Because here's the thing. Let's say Caleb Williams does have the amazing, incredible career. It doesn't mean that that would have happened on the Bears. You know, it's what you got to tell yourself. The Bears drafted Mahomes. He probably would have shit the bat. He probably would have thrown like 30 interceptions because they would not have had any of the ability with coaching and development that the Chiefs had. You know, and that's just real. It's unfortunate, you know, or he at least wouldn't have become what he became. Like maybe he was, he ends up being Jake Cutler, you know, to give him a little more credit. Maybe it wouldn't be that horrific because he's just that talented. Um, but so, yeah. And then, you know, with your other pick, you just take what you need. Maybe, you know, depending on what your return is, if you're getting more draft picks or if you're getting a player and less draft picks. I think you take the second player based on what your return is, but how would that not put them right there? His athleticism, like it truly is unrivaled and he really does need to trust his receivers more, but you know, DJ Moore is a huge guy with a big frame and he gets open and You know, Mooney gets open, but you don't trust the catch radius the same way, and he might get rocked a little bit easier. I'm not saying that that's that I know this for sure, but I'm just saying if fucking Marvin Harrison's the guy on the other side, you might get rid of it a little faster. He might appear open sooner. He's bigger, stronger, faster. And Mooney would be a good three, but I don't know. Would somebody pay him a big chunk? I think his season's so poor. We might be able to just get him on an extension for cheap. Uh, which I would consider, because him as a three-slot guy, I mean, we're, we'd be lighting it up under the proper circumstances. But Fields is not so incompetent that, you know, at this point the mistakes are outweighed by the positives. Honestly, it's probably the first time I felt that. You know? I mean, last year... He just ran it so much and did everything he could to not have to throw it that I guess there were a lot of positives last year also, but I mean, the percentage of bad throw was high. Just, you know, the circumstances were pretty unbelievable. So the fact that he put up numbers that aren't horrific with the supporting cast he had... I, I'm I'm back in, you know, and I, I, I was hurt early in the season. You know, I apologize, but it's a fucking roller coaster of a year. And the expectations were set so high from them that it just rocked me to my core. What can I say? But I, I think I think he's earned it. And unfortunately, my ideal situation would be. Poles stays, field stays, trade the first pick for a great return, said all that. I wish you could demote Flus to D coordinator. Obviously, that doesn't work. And fire Getze. And then hire like Harbaugh and an offensive coordinator or hire Ben Johnson. And that would be amazing. Um, the enemy, I don't really think is a great idea just because Sam Howell leads the league in sacks, but that's because Washington's terrible. But. I just don't want plays designed where you have to hold the ball. We need like a West, not Getsy's West Coast, because that obviously isn't working. They're just lateral routes that don't make sense. But like, you know what I mean? We need a quick passing game is my point. But yeah, I don't know. I forgot what I was talking about. That would be the ideal situation. Um but realistically, I do think Flus needs to be fired. Now, if they do happen to win out, I just don't see it. I think realistically they'll go two and two and up seven and ten and should have been nine and eight. Um, but if they end up nine and eight, 
Honestly, maybe he does deserve to stay. You know, who knows? But I just don't see that happening. So this is my overall point with the Bears, and then we'll get into the rest of the league three-quarter recap. I didn't think this would take this long, but I didn't think I'd be this high. They're, this is what the Bears do. They tease you, and then they disappoint the fuck out of you. And look, Cleveland's going to be a tough matchup. I've been saying on these NFL episodes that they're a pretty great team. I do like watching them. I am afraid of them. Their defense, at least. And the offense is playing well with fucking Joe Flacco, who I hate, which is horrible. But he is an old man, so if we can get pressure, I think we can turn the ball over on them. I can see the defense succeeding against their offense. It's hard for me to see our offense succeeding against their defense. So I don't imagine they win, but I would be, you know, obviously pleasantly surprised for that. But it's a prime setup for disappointment where like you could see them winning, but then they're just not going to show up. And I would love to be proven wrong. And maybe that's a sign. Like, this is what I'm saying. If they can string together wins now, I think even eight and nine, he gets fired. Honestly, and deserves to is what I mean. I don't know if that means it happens. It probably doesn't if they're eight and nine. Um, but. You know, that's why I think realistically they're going to go two and two because they're heartbreaking and that's just what they do. Um, But I am, unfortunately, my actual thought, I'm on the hype train because I'm like, oh, they're back. I love them and it's blinders because they're my team and I care way too much. And I feel like they really could win these next four because they're playing fucking awesome and that Lions win was fucking awesome. (laughs) A truly complete game. That means they're due for a dud, but... My fucking hype ass. I think they can do it. Four straight. Let's go. They're going to do it. But they're not. But they're just not. Oh, they might. <laughs> but I, they may have a chance. But that that's what will, I think, decide the future. But if they made the fucking playoffs, that would be insane. Um, That might be what it takes to save fields, though. So, anyway, we'll see. Long way to go, obviously. I will react to that, I'm sure, next week, to see, depending how Cleveland goes. If it's a close loss... Uh, with not an embarrassing huge moment at the end Uh, you know it'll be a lot more brief of a comment that's all i'll say but if it's horrific in any way or a significant win or loss i'll be screaming either way all right on to the rest of the nfl Uh, i'm just gonna start with patrick mahomes being a little bitch look i mean he's mad because they called a penalty and I, I just don't even really understand the argument. He's like, what is that? Who calls that? It's like everybody. It's a penalty. You know? It's like, he's like, well, we made a great play on the play. And you call that penalty? It didn't affect the play. It's like, well, that's a lot of penalties. They don't affect the play, actually. Especially in offsides. Um, But that it's just a rule and that's a penalty. I mean... Frank Clark, when he was offsides, when Tom Brady threw that interception, didn't affect the play. It wasn't the reason he threw that interception. Doesn't mean they didn't call it. Like, still a penalty. Um, so that argument's just bizarre. And for him to say it to Josh Allen post game, like, it's the lack of sportsmanship right there. I think that's what everybody's really reacting to. Being mad on the sidelines, one thing. I totally understand that, actually. It was a bit dramatic either way, and him trying to, like, bark at the refs was also cringy. Um, But I think realistically, he's just frustrated that his team fucking sucks for the first time. That's really what it is. You know, just being honest. I mean, Kadarius Tony fucking sucks. He's horrible. (laughs) Like, yeah, he made some great plays in the postseason miraculously. Um, the enemy is clearly great and Matt Nagy's a cuck who the fuck would have thought uh, <laughs> but yeah I mean they're, they're they suck their their receivers are terrible the Bears have a better receiving core than the Chiefs um that, that's true and running back like <laughs> it's kind of crazy but they're bad and he's frustrated. Um, rightfully so. He's used to just being incredible. And that play was sick. But like, holy shit, he was fucking offside. And even in the all-22, in the all it's so much worse. 
He is so clearly like very offside and just staring at the ball. So you would think would realize where he's lined up. It the lack of awareness is pretty unbelievable, I got to say. Um For the way it's offside on defense, though, they should just stop. Oh, they don't stop the play. Never mind. I guess in case it was intercepted or something. That yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um. But yeah, that was just unbelievable. The fact that he would say that to Allen, and then like be weird that they called it. Like they definitely should have called it. It's just crybaby shit. Um, but I, I, you know, I think it comes from frustration with the lack of production. So, but yikes. Um, I think that turned a lot of people off. Uh, cause Josh Allen has lost some horrific games and to Patrick Mahomes and man, the guy looks defeated, but he's a man about it. Uh, he literally, he acted like a fucking baby. It was kind of embarrassing. Um, I don't know if he's come out and said anything about it today, which, you know, if he comes out and is like, you know, my bad, that was a bitch move. I'd be like, all right, dude, thanks for acknowledging it. (laughs) All right. So every team has played 12 games at least, or 13 games at least, except for for some reason there's two Monday night games on tonight for no reason at all. I don't understand that. Uh, Which means we have four games remaining. The three-quarter season recap. Just going to run through the standings here. Miami plays tonight, so I don't know how that's going to go. But they look fucking amazing. So as long as nobody gets hurt, they're going to be awesome. I hope Tyreek gets to 2,000 yards, which is achievable. Um... That would be thrilling to see. Buffalo, look, everybody is always quick to dismiss them like every year, and they have easy games. Like They're going to get at least two more wins no matter what. Is that enough for them to get in? I don't know. But I hope they make the playoffs. That would be more exciting. Yeah, they're flawed, but who the fuck is like a lock? Nobody. You know? The whole thing is wide open. So all you got to do is get in in the AFC and you can end up in the Super Bowl no problem. There is no favorite. The Dolphins are not the favorite. I don't care. Like, even if they technically should be, that just doesn't sound right, you know? The Jets, I mean, look, Zach Wilson played good for once. Good for them, but they're fucked. Just an unbelievably tragic story for them. Uh, New England, horrific also. I mean, the fact that they lost 6 to nothing. That stat about them only allowing 10 points and losing three games. The only team that's ever done that. Like, unbelievable that their defense can still be that good in this fucking... I mean, Bill O'Brien's maybe lost it. Uh, Jones lost it. They broke him last year. Horrific, that poor guy. Um... I wish they would play Malik Cunningham, but I guess he must not be very good. But who knows? Uh, Baltimore, I hate them, and they keep winning. Uh, I wish that they lost in overtime, but they didn't. And, that you know, they might win the fucking Super Bowl. Who knows? I could see it. Um, but was Lamar in the playoffs. He's still got to prove it. He won one game, acted like he won the Super Bowl, and then they got smacked again. Uh, so we'll see. Cleveland, like I said, I I mean, they're going to make it. I can just feel it. It just, you know, they'll probably beat the Bears. I hope that they don't. There's a chance that they don't, as I just professed. The Texans probably a win now. The Texans seem broken, like an easier win. The Jets is a win, and the Bengals, who knows? But, I mean, I think that they'll get in with 10 wins. So, all they got to do is go 2-2. and I respect them. Pittsburgh, they're a dumpster fire. They can probably end up going two and two just so Tomlin's streak keeps going somehow, but maybe not. You know, the Colts and the Seahawks, they could win those. I don't know. But if they make the playoffs, they're not a threat. Cincinnati, the Jake Browning thing, insane. Um, I wonder if he'll be one of those like hype guys that hasn't happened in a long time. Like the Matt Castle situation. He's gonna get like a huge contract for playing well on this incredible team. Uh which, you know, no takeaway for him, though. The, the fact that he's playing well is obviously, you know, good. Um, 
So if they make the playoffs, who knows with Jake Browning? I don't know. Maybe Burrow's going to pull a Rodgers and be like, actually, bitch, I'm back. You never know. But uh, I don't see them as a threat unless that does happen with Burrow. Uh, Jacksonville hate him. Lawrence sucks. He shouldn't have played hurt. Um, They're definitely not a threat. Indy, definitely not a threat. Houston, I mean, they weren't going to be either way, but now they might just lose a bunch with Tank Dell out. Uh, Their offense definitely played like shit against the Jets, to say the least. Uh, Maybe a little bit of the rookie magic kind of running low. We'll see. I mean, they could rebound with a good game, but, you know. I doubt that the Texans also, you know, would, like, win the Super Bowl. So could they make it? Sure. Tennessee, nothing really to say. Bad, bad year for them. Sad. I like Vrabel a lot. I like him a lot. Kansas City, you know. I think I said all I need to say there. Their defense is pretty damn fucking good, and their offense is fucking horrible. Uh, their receivers are terrible. <laughs> Just terrible. I like Rasheed Rice, though. He's He seems good. But he's a rookie. So, you know, you have to deal with rookie stuff, and that's what's stressful about Rasheed Rice, but he's just a rookie, you know? So you kind of can't blame him. Um, it's unfortunate. Denver, you know, who would have fucking thought that Sean Payton's an incredible fucking coach, and they just keep winning and they might make the playoffs. And, you know, Denver could win the fucking Super Bowl giving up 70 points one game. Wouldn't shock me because Sean Payton's amazing. Um, I don't know how they keep winning because I'm convinced that they're bad, but they just keep fucking winning and uh, they're good. So I think Denver's probably going to be in. The Chargers, sad sack. Vegas, I mean, even more sad. That game was 0-0. Zero to zero. Field goal with like two minutes left. Unbelievable. The Vikings, dumpster fire also. Uh, Dallas, they're unbelievable. They're definitely actually good. I hate that Mike McCarthy's a good coach. I hate that Dallas is good. Dak might be the fucking MVP. Tragic. Uh, Philly, I need to stop putting money on them. Two weeks in a row, they've absolutely burned me. They suck right now. Um, I could see them just falling apart and losing to, but you know i could also see them responding well but i thought they were going to respond well this game and they didn't but you know they've had a tough stretch in a row you know they went cowboys chiefs eagles 49ers cowboys and they beat the cowboys they beat the chiefs they beat the bills lost the 49ers and cowboys i mean they're probably just fucking exhausted um so I think the Seahawks will be a nice break for them, honestly, and they they might get back to business than Giants, Cardinals, Giants. I think they'll be fine, but I think that they're a little gassed, to be honest. That's how it looks. Um, I would prefer they get the number one seed, but unless they turn, like, they need to really turn it around because it's starting to look like Dallas is more of a threat for a championship, which terrifies me to say. The Giants, I hope Tommy DeVito just keeps playing fucking excellent. Um, I hope his stats are unreal. I love the guy. The fact that he went to Illinois is hilarious because their football program is horrific. And he played well, I guess. They were briefly kind of good, Devin Witherspoon and all that. But um, everything about that is hilarious, that he's from right by the stadium and you know the whole gist. Tommy Cutlets. Uh, yeah, I hope he just balls the fuck out. It would be amazing if he won the starting job. I don't know if it'll go that far, but if he's like Brock Purdy for Italians, that would be amazing. Washington, who cares? They're they're horrible. Just horrible. Uh, no reason to talk about them. Detroit, concerning performances lately. They just keep turning it over a lot. They're playing the Broncos next. Like, the Broncos have been good. I think they'll beat the Vikings twice. Them against the Cowboys and them against the Broncos. We'll see. Like, uh, like, have they lost it or are they very good? But I think they're very good still. I'm not too worried about it. The defense is a concern. Minnesota, like I said, they suck. Uh, they're they're going to lose to the Bengals. They're going to lose to the Lions. They're going to lose out. I think they'll just lose out. They're terrible. Nothing to say. The Packers, I think, are fucking good, and I hate it. I hope they lose tonight to the Giants, but that probably won't happen. They'll probably come out and kick the shit out of them. Um, But we'll see. I think that the Packers are probably good, and that's annoying, but I don't want to talk about it. 
Uh, the whole NFC South is an absolute mess. Tampa is the best team. Atlanta fucking sucks. I'm out on them. They, I thought, were going to be my fun team of the year. They're not fun. Their offense is grueling and brutal to watch, and I don't know why. It doesn't make sense. They should be fucking electric, and they're awful. So I'm out. I hope Tampa wins. They have the experience. Their defense is good. In the playoffs, they could probably win a game or two. Uh, New Orleans is horrible also. Terrible to watch. Same thing. They're just awful. The defense is good, but who cares? doesn't mean anything. Carolina, thank God for you. David Tepper's a joke, and thank God for you. God bless David Tepper. Um, Keep losing, and you will. Uh, They can win one more. That's fine. If you guys want to get one, that's okay. Um, But that's it. San Francisco probably going to win the Super Bowl. I think right now they are almost like them versus the Cowboys again in the playoffs. What happens? Or not again. Oh, yeah, they played earlier in the season, and they smoked them. But the way the Cowboys are playing now, you know, I don't know, in the playoffs. I, I mean, and they just rock the Eagles. Like, what more do you need to prove? And Brock Purdy's, like, fucking great, legitimately. Like, you want to say it's a system thing. Like, Jimmy G, everybody said Jimmy G sucked. Like, but he clearly wasn't that bad. But clearly, like, Brock Purdy is excelling beyond, like, all of that shit. And he, like, leads the league in yards and yards per attempt. And, like, probably completion percentage, but I don't know about that. Actually, probably not. Um, and has like a ton of touchdowns and not very many turnovers and is like very efficient and is just heaving it. And yeah, there's yards after catch. Great. You have great players. Like insane argument. Uh, he's probably runner up for MVP between him and Dak just cause Dak gets more love, which he also gets tremendously more amounts of hate. I'm aware of that, but he deserves it. He's been terrible. Um, the Rams, look, I just never bought into it. Uh, I don't think that they're very good. I thought that they could have beat the Ravens, but it's like that's their, that's kind of their level. Like They're competitive with good teams but can't really close them out because they, they don't have any names on their defense other than Donald. Like I don't know one guy on their entire defense and barely on their offense. Only the guys that have like popped out and obviously Cup and Stafford, you know. Um, Seattle, yeah, just this is the same thing we expected. They're just going to be like mid, and they'll maybe end up with a winning record. Maybe not. Wouldn't surprise me either way. They're the Seahawks, but not a threat. You know, just like a ton of like not a threat. Uh, And Arizona, you know, whatever. Just win another game. And, um, you know, New England win another game. And then, you know, the Panthers can win two games. And that's fine. Um, So looking at the playoff picture right now to close this out. In the AFC, Baltimore's the one, Miami's the two, KC is the three, Jacksonville four, Cleveland five, Pittsburgh six, and Indy is in right now as the last spot. With Houston, Denver, Cincy, Buffalo all having the same record vying for that last spot. Um, I think Pittsburgh and Indy both end up out. They're all seven and six, and it'll probably be Denver and Buffalo. Now, other teams will need to lose for that to happen. It's not like everybody could win, you know, whatever, obviously. Um, <clears throat> those are at least the two best teams. Now, maybe it's Cincinnati instead of one of those two. I don't know. But that's how it's looking. That's my prediction. We'll see how it goes. So, and who knows how the order, I think the order might change around for the one through five also. But no real prediction there. I think all those teams are locked, like, to make it. Either way, I mean, maybe Jacksonville drops out completely somehow, too. That would be the one I could see, but that would be it. Cleveland, maybe, too, in a surprise, but, you know, seems unlikely. Um, San Francisco, I think, will stay the one. I think they'll probably win out. They seem unbeatable, although they do have to play the Ravens. I think that would be a tough matchup, and the Rams do usually play them well. But I think if they need it to get the one seed, they would win. Um, and like you know the Cowboys play the Bills next so the Bills really need to prove that they're a playoff team here so maybe they would be a team that doesn't make it but I don't know Uh, maybe Dallas loses that game finally I would love that 
But they're definitely in, obviously. Detroit's going to make it no matter what, just because the division's so bad. They're not going to go 9-8, and eight, that's for sure. So, <clears throat> Tampa, 6-7. and seven. This is currently the division lead, but th- that whole division, 6-7. and seven. What a fucking disaster. Uh, Philly is 5. Minnesota, 6. Green Bay is in right now. Now, if they lose tonight, uh, they would probably still be in because a bunch of teams are at 6-7. and seven. Um Below them, Minnesota's going to drop out. I'm convinced of that. Wow, the Bears, really, if they could just win a couple games in a row here, would really be right in it. Well, fuck, they should be 6-7. and seven. This is bullshit. They'd be right in it. This is horrible. Well, they should be 7-6, and six, and you know. Fuck. What a fuck. What assholes. Fire the fucking coach. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I want to say the Bears get in at the 7, obviously. <sighs> But I think Green Bay makes it. Oh, but imagine we spoil it for them on the last night of the year. We would lose. They're going to kill us. They kill us every time. I have no fucking idea who makes it in the NFC. The NFC is terrible. Oh, my God. Maybe the Rams will make it. Fuck it. But I think Minnesota drops out, and I guess the Rams go in is my prediction. But it's really the Bears. Um... All right, so that's the three-quarter season recap. We will see what happens. I will be back on edibles in four weeks for the 100 milligram end of season recap. Um, well, I'll be back next week with another episode, of course, but just letting you know that there will be a continuation of this series, and then I'll be back the week after and the week after, and then it'll be the recap. All those episodes are going to happen in a row. There's going to be no gaps, just so you know. <laughs> well, actually, I don't know. There might not be one on, like, New Year's time. Uh, I'm too high. I'll keep you posted. <laughs> I'll give a clearer message later. All right, rate, review, subscribe. Please share this episode. I'm super high, so I got to go. Remember, I are fat. You are fat. We are fat. Calculator.